Good evening, everyone, and welcome to what is our first in-person Doc Talks presentation for the past four years. I'm Karen Perkin. I'm the Vice President, Patient Care, and Chief Nurse Executive here at St. Joseph's Healthcare. And I'm delighted to welcome you here this evening for what I know will be a fascinating presentation. Many of you are joining as supporters of our foundation, and for that, we are very grateful. It is through your generosity that St. Joseph's is able to invest in specialized care for you and your family. I want to acknowledge Chartwell Retirement Residences for sponsoring our Doc Talks lecture series. Chartwell is committed to fostering healthy communities across the country, and we're grateful for their support to host these community health discussions for you. Tonight, we are pleased to have Dr. Narinder Paul, Chief of Medical Imaging at St. Joseph's, joining us to share information about game-changing imaging and how new technology at for St. Joseph's is helping to diagnose disease faster and earlier and how it will propel research for the future. Before we go into the presentation, I'd like to share with you a little bit more about Dr. Paul. Dr. Paul came to London in 2017 when he began serving as Professor and Chair of Medical Imaging at Western University, the Department Head of Medical Imaging at London Health Sciences Centre, and as well as the role of Chief of Medical Imaging here at St. Joseph's. He is also a scientist at the Lawson and Robarts Research Institutes. As a clinician researcher, Dr. Paul is interested in image optimization, ultra-low-dose cardiothoracic CT and lung perfusion CT. He has been working very closely with industry partners for almost two decades and has been instrumental in bringing new and cutting-edge technology to London to support medical care and to advance research. Tonight, he will be presenting Theranostic Oncology, a new and exciting frontier for cancer treatment. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Narendra Paul. Thank you very much, very kind, and uh, thank all of you for coming to, to us on this evening. I know it's the first time we've seen the sun for a while, and I'm very grateful that you've dedicated that time to be with us. Uh, I know the... Uh, the heavens are shining down because yesterday was a blizzard and I wondered whether that we got, but today we've got the sun. So someone obviously wanted you to be here. And, um, you know, we're in a very, very exciting time and uh, a very exciting time in healthcare. We're also at a very challenging time. And you probably know that the, the ability for us to provide timely access to care for all of our citizens is, is, is at, a, um, at a critical point. But at the same time, there are things that are happening in healthcare which are looking at addressing some of the most difficult parts of care for patients who don't have a, a good option with conventional therapy. And that's the sort of thing we're going to be talking about today. One of the things I will acknowledge is um, the place, the part that St. Joe's plays uh, in this area of theranostics, and specifically the parts that our imaging scientists and our scientists play. And that's going to unfold as we go through the story. I have to say, I wasn't involved in much of it. This has been something that's been building over decades. And some of the people in this room are very, very much part of the foundational efforts. And the foundation itself and the hospital itself been absolutely central to everything we've been able to do here. So and you'll see that unfold. I'm hoping you can all hear me because my voice is very soft. We've been tweaking this thing. Are you okay at the back there? Perfect. Because it doesn't get any louder. Trust me. My kids think it does, but it really doesn't. <laughs> So theranostic oncology, sometimes called radiotheranostics, sometimes simply called theranostics. The term is interchangeable, and I'm just going to call it theranostics to keep it simple, and I'm going to explain what that is. But the first thing is we need to go over what we're going to cover today. The first thing is why am I talking about this? Why should you be interested? Why is it important, right? Why is always important? Because my kids, when they were very younger, they kept saying why, right? So, so I've learned the why is very important. What is the problem? And what is theranostics? Who is involved in theranostics? And who might benefit from theranostics? Where is this performed? Where is, where is the equipment? Where are the scientists? 
And how is St. Joe's poised to be a Canadian leader in this field? So the first thing is why? Why are we having this conversation today? So the first thing is, so if we look at this graph, on the vertical axis, we have prevalence. So prevalence is how much of a condition is, is in the community right now. So prevalence of cancer is this graph. Now I wanna be pointing out, this is not necessarily life-threatening cancer. There's a lot of cancers that are not life-threatening and never will threaten anybody, okay? So don't get alarmed by this graph. And on the horizontal axis is increasing age. So we know that very young children have a peak of certain cancers which are unique to them. And after that, the incidence or prevalence of cancer is very low. Very low until you start hitting the 50s. And with increasing age, the incidence of all cancers starts to increase. Remember, not necessarily life-threatening, so don't get panicky in, in the audience here. But we see this, so as we get older, the, in, the prevalence of cancer increases. And as the prevalence of cancer increases, there will be people who have certain cancers that are difficult to treat. Now, the population is getting older, which is a good thing, right? Because nobody wants to die early. But as, as, as the population is getting older, the people presenting with cancer is going to become more and more. So this is, becomes important. How do we address this? If we look at males and females and look at the most common cancers, in males, the graph on the left in yellow is prostate cancer. So about 29% of patients have prostate cancer. Now, every man, if they live long enough, is going to get prostate cancer. But that doesn't mean that prostate cancer is going to be symptomatic. Because if you do biopsies on enough men, you're going to find little cells of prostate cancer. So the vast majority of men with prostate cancer are not going to have an issue with it. But a small number will. And we'll talk about that part. Women, about a third of women have breast cancer, okay? And, and there's, there's issues with that sort of disease as well, as you may know. So when we diagnose a cancer, we need to see what the stage of that cancer is, meaning where is it in the body? Is it localized to the area that we diagnosed or is it spread? And there is something called the tumor node and metastatic staging, TNM. The, the M stands for, uh, is there evidence of disease beyond the original organ? The N is what lymph nodes are involved. But this graph shows the T, the tumor itself, just for illustration purposes. So prostate on the left, breast on the right. So the stage is important. Why is that? So if you look at prostate, T1 is just a small nodule in the prostate confined to the prostate gland itself. T2 is if it's starting to bulge outside the capsule. T3 is it invading adjacent organs like the seminal vesicles, T4 going beyond the prostate into surrounding tissues. So this is where we use imaging to say, what's the T stage? For breast, similar sort of thing. If you have non-invasive breast cancer, it says stage zero. If you have a tumor that's invasive but small, it's T stage one. Stage two is a slightly larger tumor. Stage three, the tumor has got to a certain size, started to touch adjacent structures, stage four, it spreads to other organs. So we spend a lot of time trying to stage a disease once the diagnosis is made. And why is that important? Well, if you look at prostate cancer on the left and you look at breast cancer on the right, the good news is if you have early stage disease, so localized to the organ or very close, in prostate cancer, five-year survival rates are excellent. Really, really very good, as close to 100% as you can get. The problem is, as you get distant spread of disease, survival rates drop dramatically to about a third at five years. So the extent of disease spread is very, very important. And the same with breast. Early stage disease, very well, very well treated, be it surgery, be it chemotherapy, radiotherapy. Uh, but as you get more distant disease, it's really tricky to teach, treat. And conventional therapy doesn't work for everybody. And this is a problem for us, right? Because we have patients who have difficult to treat prostate cancer, difficult to treat breast cancer. So what do we do for these patients? Because yeah. conventional therapy doesn't work as well as we'd like it to work. It's March break, so let's think about a beach scene, right? So imagine that this beach scene is a part of somebody's body. Let's imagine it's the prostate. Let's just take that as we're talking about prostate. The prostate has many normal cells. That's all these people. These are normal prostate cells and there's other types of cells which are also part of the normal prostate. But this, 
prostate has a cancer cell, and that's the red tent. Okay, so let's just imagine that's the situation. And let's just imagine that other parts of the prostate also have cancer. We're going to give chemotherapy. So the way chemotherapy works is you inject a drug into a vein. It goes all the way around the body, and where it finds the cancer cells, it will treat it. The issue with some chemotherapy is that it will treat the cancer cell, but it says, you know what? I see blue tents, and this doesn't look like normal cells, so I'm going to treat those as well because I think they're cancer cells, but they're not. It also says there's these funny things that I don't think are normal cells, so I'm going to treat those as well. So it starts to, the chemotherapy starts to affect normal cells, which are not cancer cells. So this is why with some chemotherapies, they affect rapidly growing cells. For example, hair cells. Now I'm not sure why I'm pointing to my head because I don't have any. <laughs> but imagine, imagine I had hair, and chemo so rapidly growing cells, right? It affects the bone marrow cells. So if you have red cells, you get chemo, you get anemic. If you have white cells, you get some chemotherapies, you're prone to infections and it affects the platelets, so you're prone to bleeding. Chemotherapy can also affect the muscles, so you feel sore. It can affect the GI tract and you feel sick. It affects the heart. Now, it doesn't happen to everybody, and it's not with every chemotherapy, but we know this happens to patients. So even if the chemotherapy is very effective at treating the disease, the patient can go, get so sick from the chemotherapy, they can't actually finish the course. And so they can't get the response that we'd like to see. And this is because chemother some chemotherapies are not specific. They'll treat the cancer, but they'll also affect other things, okay? This is not all chemotherapies, but there's some. And what works for one patient may not work for another patient, right? So there's that patient um, differentiation. What we really want, what we really want is a treatment that actually is very specific for the cancer cell. So what we want is to say, that's the cancer cell. We want some, a treatment that can identify the cancer cell, so it diagnoses where the cancer cell is, and it only treats the cancer cell, and there's no collateral damage. That's what we want. You've probably heard the concept of a magic bullet. Okay. So Theranostics is as close to the magic bullet as we're going to get. And the things that are involved in Theranostics, if we look at the diagram on the right, you have a cancer cell. Each cancer cell has each type of cancer has its own unique surface proteins, which can be identified. We have a molecular engineer, a molecular protein chemist that can design a molecule that will recognize those unique surface proteins and attach to those proteins and no other proteins. So it can be specific for a certain type of cancer. And then you have a radionuclide, a radioisotope, which can be used for diagnosis and for treatment. So how does this work? So let's just imagine, here's a stylized picture of a, a human cell, just a normal cell. In the middle, you have all the stuff that goes on the factory, and on the cell surface, you have a wall that has lipids and proteins. And here on the surface of the cell, you have some proteins which are individual to that particular cell. So it's like a fingerprint. It's that cell and no other cell. So if you look at a prostate cancer cell at the bottom, there's the cell wall, it's got various proteins, but if it's a prostate cancer cell, it will have this protein, which is called prostate-specific membrane antigen, so PSMA. Now, if we can design a protein that will recognize this and nothing else, then we actually have one part of our magic bullet. Because that protein, when we inject it to the body, will go to every cancer, prostate cancer cell. If you have prostate cancer and breast cancer, it'll only go to the prostate cancer, right? The next thing we need to do is, okay, that's fine. We can, we can create the protein, the molecule, but the molecule is not going to show us, it's not going to show up on our scans, and it's not going to treat the cancer. So we need to link something that's going to do that, and that's where the radionucleotide comes in. So a radionucleotide or a radioisotope is an unstable compound. Sometimes you can find these in nature. But often you can make them in a nuclear reactor or in a cyclotron, which we happen to have at St. Joe's. So Mike Kovacs and the team are often doing these kind of things, busy in the basement, creating all sorts of wonderful things. So we can create isotopes. And these isotopes, because they're unstable, when they become more stable, they give off radiation. 
and allowing me some poetic license, I think of the types of radiation as heavy and light. The heavy radiation doesn't move a big distance, but it creates a lot of damage. So this would be really good for treatment, because if you can attach that radiation to a molecule that goes to the cancer cell, it will destroy that cancer cell, but it won't give you collateral damage to normal tissues. So that's fantastic. The radioisotope, which has light radiation, the light radiation doesn't cause much damage, but it travels a long distance. So that we can use to detect the cancer in the body because the distance from a patient's body to a scanner. Okay? So how do we combine the two of those things? When we've created a molecule, and, and this has been done for prostate, so PSMA is a molecule that's available now, right? So we need to attach it to a radioisotope. So when we want to diagnose, we've diagnosed the cancer, now we want to see where it is in the body. We will inject a compound that contains a radioisotope with the light uh, gamma rays, link the two, inject it into the body, and do a PET CT so we can see where in the body the disease is. Now we know where it is, now we have to treat it. So then we inject the same molecule, but now it's attached to the heavy radiation because it goes into the body, we know where it's going to go, and it treats the cancer cells where they were. Okay? And then finally, after we've treated the course of uh, treatment, we can do the diagnostic piece again with the first compound, which has got the light radiation. So we can do the diagnosis. So it's diagnosis, treatment, 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 diagnosis. That's the cycle. Why are we so excited about this? So this paper was published in 2018. Each box is an individual patient, and each of these patients have metastatic prostate cancer, which was resistant to conventional therapy, resistant to castration. And just to orientate yourself, the picture on the left in each box is pre-treatment. So this was the diagnostic scan, pre-treatment. The patient had the cycles of treatment, and this is the post-treatment scan. The patient is facing us, arms are up. Okay, so if we, if we take this patient here, here's the face, can't quite see the arms. Here's the thorax, here's the body, so kidneys, here's the pelvis. All the red is prostate cancer that spread throughout the body. So that's where that patient was. There's no conventional treatment we could offer them. It wasn't us, but the, the people who were doing the trial. After treatment, you can see a significant improvement. If you look at the top, this patient had prostate cancer throughout the abdomen, probably a lot of it in the spine. Post-treatment, nothing. This patient had prostate cancer in the upper arm, both sides, all through the spine, all through the bony thorax, all through the upper thighs, so here's the hip joints, and in the ribs. And afterwards, gone. This patient, much the same, all the red, all the cancer throughout the body, gone. This patient had a lot of disease, and they still have some, but the tumor burden is a lot less. And so the same, to this person. We've never seen this before. And they tolerated the treatment really well because it was specific to the prostate cancer and it didn't affect anything else in their body. And the way this treatment is given, it's you come in for a, a morning, it's an IV injection, it's 30 minutes infusion. Afterwards, we check your blood pressure and all the rest and make sure you're okay and you go home. That's what it is. It's available in many parts of the world. In Canada, it's not publicly funded, so there's some private clinics, but the government is in negotiation with the companies to make this publicly available, so we're waiting. We're poised to, to be able to provide this for our patients. This is just phenomenal. And there's work going on now that for other cancers, breast cancers, lung cancers, you name it, there's a whole bunch of companies that are spending billions of dollars investing in these kind of traces because they know for many cancers, this is the future, right? This is gonna be the future, particularly for those hard to treat cancers. And, and as we show that this is successful, they might start treating early stage disease, which is now currently treated by other ways. So this is why it's so exciting that we're at this, at this stage where we can image these compounds. These compounds can be created and they can actually be used in patients to, to great effect. So who is involved in Theranostics and where is this work done? So 
I mentioned at the beginning, there's been decades of building this kind of infrastructure here at Lawson. We have in the Lawson Imaging Research Program, some of the, the most advanced equipment you'll find anywhere in the planet, uh, certainly anywhere in Canada, and we are internationally recognized for our expertise. And people like Frank Prado, I'm not gonna to point to him because he's too modest, people like Mike Kovacs, and a whole bunch of other people have been involved in building this. So, so the infrastructure is, we have a cyclotron that can create compounds, we have a radiochemistry lab that can actually link uh, the molecule when it's provided by industry to the, to, the, uh, to the radioisotope and it can be injected. So we have those facilities. We have PET-CT. We're the first in Canada to have a PET-CT. We're actually the first in Canada to have ultrasound and ML, by the way. We're also the first in Canada to have PET-MR and one of the first in the world. So a lot of mindful investment, a lot of firsts. And we continue to do this at Joe's because of the uh, direction that the scientists have gone and because of the support from the hospital and because of the foundation and the support the community has done. So this is, this is really, really impressive. So how are we improving things? Because we can never stay still. How are we investing in infrastructure so Joe's will be a leader in this field and continue to lead? So let's talk about the cyclotron and radiochemistry lab. And this is where Mike Kovacs uh, uh, runs the show. Uh, Mike and his team, have built over many years a very impressive uh, uh, array of equipment. So this is the cyclotron, which can create those compounds we were talking about. And there's a whole bunch of other machines, which I don't know what they do. And I'm sure some of these are espresso machines, but Mike tells me that, <laughs> well, that, that they do really wonderful things. Um, Justin Hicks, who's our radio chemist, is also sort of, he doesn't want to be left behind. So he's also invested some of the, the latest, greatest stuff to be able to make compounds, which a lot of people other, comp uh, other institutions do not have access to. So but there's a lot of in interesting things happening here. And it doesn't come cheap. So Mike and the team have been doing a lot of grant writing. So 1.2 million recently uh, for this uh, Impact CFI facility. So Joe's Foundation put in $1.1 million to uh, help with some other equipment. And of course, another grant to help with the PetMR CFI. So a lot of grant writing, a lot of support from the foundation, a lot of support from our community to really get the latest, greatest stuff that we don't see in many other organizations. So um, what else are we doing? So we talked about creating molecules. So we've got through the foundation and in, in combination with the university uh, donor support, we've got two chairs that we're looking at. One is a molecular biologist to be able to do this kind of work. And one is a radiochemist to be able to do this kind of work. So we're looking for people who are research orientated, who can dedicate a significant amount of time to be part of the team to develop these compounds to push us uh, ahead in the future. We've also, looking at the imaging equipment, we are the first in the country to get a Omni 2 PET CT. This is the latest, greatest machine from GE, and you may have heard the announcement that we are the first in the world center of excellence molecular imaging theranostics with GE. GE are a multinational company, and they work with lots of big, big organizations all over the world but we're the first to be designated as a center of excellence. That means they're gonna partner with us to create research programs, to look at the best case scenario, to look at how, how we compare with other cancer centers. So Karen was part of a, um, a performance review. So, so GE look at all the big cancer centers and they came to uh, St. Joe's to see how we rank at various stages of preparation to a lot of the other cancer centers and we're ranking really, really very well. One thing, breaking news, I can tell you, I had a conversation with the Canadian CEO of GE. They're so impressed by what's happening here. They're so keen with the partnership and the work that's been done by Ting Lee, Frank, uh, Mike, and others. They're hiring a, a theranostics scientists from GE to embed them here in London. So they're not cheap, but that's, that's the first in the world. Like, GE work with Stanford and all these big, that's the first in the world that they're committing because they know all the wonderful things that are happening and they wanna be part of this journey. So, so what's the big deal about this machine? So think about it, when, when we do PET, you inject a radioisotope, it circulates all around the body and it's giving off radiation, right? So imagine for me, I'm injected with an isotope and it's giving off radiation top of my head to my toes all the time, and it's breaking down all the time. So if I have an old PET CT, which we used to have, because we had the first and we had the oldest, and the detector is 15 centimeters long, 
15 centimeters and I'm 100, almost 180 centimeters. And the detector has to start at my head, spend a few minutes there to get enough gamma rays or radiation to create a picture, then move on to the next part of my body and the next part. By the time it's got to my toes, it was 45 minutes being in the PET CT. Now, 45 minutes might not be so bad for me because I can fall asleep anyway. But for someone who's got cancer, who's not there for the health, they're there because they're sick. Someone who's got Alzheimer's who can't stay still, that's a long time. This new machine, the detector is twice the length of the original, 32 centimeters. So now you can go twice as fast. Not only can you go twice as fast, so it's better for the patient, but because you go twice as fast, you can use half the radiation dose because you know, you're doing imaging quickly. Now we bought this machine because it's scalable. So you can actually put four lots of detectors, each of 32 centimeters, and go up to a maximum 1.28 mm, uh, meters. So in theory, if you do that, you could actually get a whole body done, I don't know, two, three minutes. Now the problem with that is, you're getting the scan done faster than the patient can walk into the machine. Whether we need to do that or not, I'm not sure, but, but it allows us to really think about where are we gonna go? You know, how far do we wanna build this up? Because the radiation dose is important, very small. Speed is important, get it very quick. But some of the other things that are important is, we know that some diseases, it's not just one organ. We know that sometimes in some diseases, it's, it's the way the heart is working, plus the liver, plus the kidneys, and plus the brain. And we've never been able to look at the way these function all at one time in, in space and time. So if you've got a detector that covers all of them and you inject a radioisotope, you can see in real time how these different organs work together. And if you've got a treatment, you can see how that treatment responds to these different organs at the same period of time. And if you know the way a complex disease works, then you can find a way to treat. So that's why this kind of equipment becomes really interesting because for the first time ever, we can start imaging in real time to see what's going on with the patient and start to personalize the dose. One of the things I've shared with you about the six courses of therapy and cycles is the companies, the manufacturers will say, this is a standard dose and you will give everybody six cycles of the same dose. But we know that patients don't respond the same to treatment. So some patients might be able to get away with one cycle. Some people may need eight cycles and we need to personalize the therapy. So we need to know how, how it works, how the disease works. So part of what we wanna do is, is add to our team, is, is add people who have expertise in looking at the way patient responds to the dose they're given, and then we can titrate the dose for the next time they have a treatment, and the next time. So we can say, well, how much does this patient actually need? So that's what personalized dosing is. It's not just giving the same cookie cutter dose for everybody who comes to the door. It's saying, <clears throat> you know, how did Mr. Smith do on his first treatment? Can we give him more? Can we give him less? Can we deliver in a different way? And this will allow us to do that as we build a team who have that sort of expertise. We're also, in honor of Frank Prater, who's somewhere in the audience, but I'm not gonna point him out because he'll get embarrassed. We've also, through the foundation support, gonna hire looking for the Frank Parra chair. So we've got a worldwide search <clears throat> for someone who's gonna be looking at all this enterprise. It's gonna be important as we develop molecular imaging and theranostics to have a leader who's got the skill set to really combine everything that's happening in the city and lead it in a way that brings us together in partnerships and for best patient care. And we know <clears throat> that although we're focusing on cancer right now, in theory, there's no reason why the same sort of approach shouldn't be used for degenerative brain disease like Alzheimer's. There's no reason why it shouldn't be used down the road for infectious diseases, which has a systemic component, or for metabolic diseases. There's, it's just a matter of identifying the mechanism of the disease, identifying the particular markers, creating the molecules to attach to those markers and nothing else, and then the, the therapy piece. So this is a technique which could potentially be leverage for many different diseases which are causing an issue in patient care right now. So I think it's a very, very, very exciting time we're in. And St. Joe's is very well placed because we've got a lot of the foundational elements to be very successful here. We still got some work to do because it'll never finish, but that's where we are at the moment. So in summary, why are we talking about theranostics in cancer? Because the incidence, 
the prevalence of cancer is increasing. And as the prevalence increases, there's more people within the cancer world who have complicated disease, which does not respond to conventional therapy. We know that if you have localized cancer, we've got very, very good treatments. But if you've got cancer that's spread through the body, we don't have very good treatments. And some of these are not well tolerated by patients. So we need to have specific therapies that can be titrated to the needs of the patient. And that's why this idea of Theranostics, developing a molecule that recognizes the cancer and then a radioisotope that can help us diagnose where that cancer is and then to treat that cancer and not to treat anything else around that cancer becomes really, really important. Where, well, we mentioned that we have a lot of the infrastructure now to do the imaging. We have some of the base infrastructure to start doing the treatments, still got things to develop. But with the investments we've made, with the partnerships that we have, we've got a fantastic cyclotron. We've got a great radiochemistry lab. We are going to be hiring uh, scientists in the radiochemistry field and the molecular biology field to really shore us up here. We are going to be looking at people who can help us with personalized dosing so that when a patient comes in, we, <clears throat> we adjust the dose for them and how they react to the treatment. We have the best PET CT that money can buy, and we have a partnership with GE, a great partner, who are going to work with us to develop that technique and that, uh, that uh, modality as far as it can go. We have a PET MRR, which we're going to replace in a year's time. We have to put some grant funding in. But if anybody here has got spare change, about $7 million, I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> and we are going down the road to the personalized medicine space. None of this would be possible without the support of our donor community. None of this would have been possible without Michelle Campbell and her team and the strong support of the hospital administration. And of course, we've got some phenomenal scientists who are doing amazing work and none of them actually get the recognition they deserve. They put someone like me who doesn't do any of this <laughs> to talk about it. But I think it's important that you understand where we are, where we're poised and why, why it's so exciting to be in healthcare right at this moment and it's St. Joe's in particular. So thank you very much. We know we're in a difficult place, but there's hope at the end of the tunnel. And it's not, it, and it's a reality, and it's coming soon. So thank you for your attention. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Campbell, president and CEO of St. Joseph's Healthcare Foundation. And um, I, I'm going to have to have a chat with my staff tomorrow because they always give me the follow up. I would have much preferred to have introduced Dr. Paul because I don't know how to follow what Dr. Paul just shared. Um, some really incredible news. And I remember, it was about a year ago, that I saw that image of the metastasized prostate cancer and the impact of Theranostics, the before and after shot, and I, I couldn't get that out of my head. Uh, one of the things I would reflect on is that um, we don't off, I've worked in healthcare a long time, and I seldom hear uh, physicians or researchers use words like magic bullet. In fact, I think there's a resistance to using that kind of language. We want to instill hope, but not create expectation. But what you saw tonight, and what we're starting to see with the application of this technology is truly remarkable, and I think it befits the term magic bullet. So we're very excited about how we feel like we're really on the cusp of the transformation of healthcare as a result. Dr. Paul mentioned, and he, he said it quickly, so I don't know if you picked up, you're sitting tonight in the ancestral home of the first place in Canada where the first ultrasound happened, where the first MRI scan took place, right here at St. Joe's Hospital in London, Ontario. And that was because of the leadership and the vision of the sisters of St. Joseph. And it's remarkable the vision that these women had to invest early in those kinds of technologies and ironically, I think Dr. Lee and Dr. Prado were here when that happened, and they're still here. Um, but, and, 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 and a credit to them, because what that has done is it shows that we have not only kept pace, but we are now setting the pace. And thanks to our community uh, and our partnership with our remarkable imaging professionals here at St. Joseph's, we've built a critical mass of technology and talent that's given us this mar remarkable opportunity to transform healthcare, uh, and we're really excited about what is to come. So congratulations again, Dr. Paul, uh, to you and to your team. Thank you, thank you so much. Dr. Paul's family is here tonight. 
Uh, so he had a tough audience. The rest of you were really easy. So Raj, how did dad do? Oh, excellent. Yeah. It did okay, <laughs> front row, front row. Okay, he got thumbs up from Raj, so that's all good. Um, I'd re really like to thank our corporate sponsor, uh, Chartwell Re Retirement Residences, for sponsoring tonight. It's really great to see all of you. We had a full house. We were actually oversold tonight uh, for the seats, and it's just so great to have you all back in person. Uh, tonight was the inaugural return of Doc Talks, and I wanted to give you a little bit of a sneak peek of what the rest of the series is going to include. We don't have the dates set yet, but you'll, you'll hear about them shortly. Dr. Cheryl Forchuk is going to be speaking about understanding the problem and solutions related to homelessness. Dr. Forchuk, uh, who uh, recently had a scientific leadership role uh, at Parkwood as part of the Parkwood Institute research, uh, has done a lot of work nationally on the issue of homelessness and has some incredible uh, data and solutions to share that you'll find of interest. Dr. Sydney Hotnick, Chair Chief of Ophthalmology here at St. Joseph's, will be presenting The Silent Thief, How to Protect Your Eyes. Dr. Michael Silverman and Dr. Jeremy Burton, From Medicine to Fermented Food, The Importance of Microbes. Dr. Sherry Lynn Kane and Dr. J uh, Jacoby Elliott, fostering a healthcare system responsive to older adults. So we are just finalizing those dates. Those will be coming up. So please stay tuned and sign up early so you can get your seat back for one of the other future offerings. I would be remiss if I did not also mention our upcoming Breakfast of Champions uh, set for May the 7th at RBC Place with Canadian TED Talk sensation Neil Pashrisha. That name may not mean much to you, but the Book of Awesome uh, he is the title author of that series, fascinating, and is going to talk about uh, the importance of happiness to mental health, and it's something we could all use a little bit more of these days. I want to thank you again for coming. I want to thank you again for all of your support of our work at St. Joseph's. A lot of uh, what you saw tonight was really enabled, as Dr. Paul said, uh, by, by the support of our community. We wouldn't be here on the, the cusp of this great transformation without the support of our community that's helped us to get here. Uh, don't rush off if you don't have to, please stay and visit. And uh, thank you again for coming and safe travels home.